Hey, it's Arrow. PodFest brings together three different conversations from musicians to authors, doctors, environmentalists, or cooks in their own kitchen. These are real people with real stories. PodFest 45 features one of music's biggest and greatest, Warren Haynes from Government Mule. Then we'll step into the world of David Bowie as experienced by biographer Wendy Lee. Conversation number three will be a true piece of Americana with Willie Robertson from Duck Dynasty. This is PodFest 45. <laughs> Unplugged and totally uncut with Warren Haynes. I have caught you so many times here in Charlotte, and this film really, really gave me the same exact shivers that I get every time you come to Charlotte. Well, thank you. When you went into this project, you had to have known that it was going to create talk and and even draw newer people to become your followers. Well, you know, our hope is that uh, people are constantly discovering what we're doing, and we, we get a lot of... 14, 15, 16-year-old music lovers that come to the shows that have never uh, experienced Government Mule prior. They say, this is my my first show. They're also the same people that are just now discovering Led Zeppelin and Jimi Hendrix and Pink Floyd and stuff. And uh, hopefully that music is having the effect on on them that it had on us. You know, uh, we... uh, our mission is to take what we do and what we love to as many people as possible without compromising it and diluting it. What was the reason behind you choosing the Capitol Theater? Because you guys put on a show everywhere, but this one right here is the one that's going to stand out the most. Well, it's a it's a great venue. Uh, it's a historic venue. I actually saw the Rolling Stones there years ago before it, before it closed down for some special uh, small uh, appearance that they were doing. Uh, it looks great. In the Capitol, it sounds great in the Capitol, and uh, the history is wonderful. Uh, it, it was the right choice for us to to do two nights and film it there. In in watching the video, Mr. Man, I'm 56 years old, and I and I heard new things in this song. Are you always trying out new things when you go and you play them live? Because I I had to keep rewinding this thing to go. There's no way he did that, and but you did. Well, that version is a bit unique. Uh, we stretched it out more at the end than we sometimes do. And we had never gone exactly there uh, on any of the previous performances. It's it's much uh, uh, more improvisational than the studio version of it. We had retired that song for a while, or, or, or at least given it a break, And so it was nice to bring it out and start playing it again, uh, and I'm glad it got included. Many of today's guitarists have been shaped by by you because they they were inspired by you. Do you ever listen to music and go, whoa, that that sounds like something that I would have done? Uh, You mean as far as thinking that somebody had listened to me and and taken that influence? Uh, From from time to time I I hear that, but, you know, that's that's what music's all about, you know. I stole something from every great guitar player I could uh, when I was in, in my formative years and, and still try to, to a lesser extent uh, these days. You know, I, I say something in, in the movie about signing on to be a musician means signing on to be a student for life because that's what it's, it's all about. If you stop learning, you stop being a musician. And so uh, it's all just a continuous cycle. You're, you're so right about that learning, because every time that I've seen you, I will sit there and watch your fingers on that guitar. And then I look up and I'm, I'm hearing you sing and I'm going, how is he doing this so well balanced? Well, it's uh, it's not an easy thing to sing and play at the same time. And I, a lot of the people that I looked up to, uh, especially someone like Jimi Hendrix, appeared to have two brains, you know, uh, it's a hard thing to do, and and when we started the trio, it was the thing that I had to concentrate the most on doing, being able to hold down uh, both responsibilities. And I got better and better at it year after year. Uh, but in the Alma Brothers, where it's like a six or seven piece band, it's it's an easier role because all I, I usually just have to concentrate on one or the other because there's so much music going on. We always talked about in a trio. All three members would have to be 100% all the time. And, uh, of course, now we're a quartet, and so you get a little more of a relaxed uh, break every now and then, but not much. Being out on the road night after night, city after city, what is the soundtrack to your life? You're, you're already a part of our life, but what what are you making your soundtrack? Well, you know, I love so many different types of music that when when I unwind at the end of the day, it's usually something 
timeless, uh, you know, whether it's Otis Redding, Ray Charles, or Miles Davis, or, or uh, you know, Van Morrison, or, or Joni Mitchell, it could be anything, you know, but I, uh, I'm always looking to experience new music that I think rivals the old music, but when it comes to kind of unwinding, I go back to the classics, you know, Aretha Franklin and that sort of thing. You provide that escape for so many people. Do you watch it unfold as you guys begin to play live? Because in, in watching this video, we're so up close. It's like we get a backstage pass. Yeah, I think uh, Danny Clinch did a wonderful job uh, directing the movie, and uh, it, you really get a, a good sense for what it was like in that room that night. It sounds great, it, it looks great, and it's, it's very intimate. Um, you know, we don't always experience it uh, the same way because we're kind of caught up in it. So when I was watching a lot of the footage, it was nice to see the way the venue changed uh, visually from moment to moment and the the crowd, we see a lot of people in the crowd that we've seen dozens of times, some some even hundreds of times, which was kind of uh, interesting to watch. Is It's like a family reunion to you then, isn't it? Yeah, I mean, we're lucky to have an audience that uh, goes on this journey with us, and, and, and I don't mean just physically, but uh, musically. Um, they encourage us to go wherever it is that we want to go musically, and and the fact that we do a different show every night, a different set list every night, keeps people coming back, and they never know what's going to happen. And I love the fact that, that people have seen 50, 100, 200 shows. I think that's awesome. We're talking about Bring On the Music live at the Capitol Theater. This is a modern-day album to me because I get to visually see it, I get to hear it, I get to experience it. And you've got interviews in there that, that you can't find anywhere else. Yeah, and, and again, we wanted to document where we are right now as a band, not just because we're embarking on this 25th anniversary, but because the band sounds consistently great every night and we're very happy with where we are as a band and i talk a, a little bit in the liner notes about uh, the relationship uh with our audience the, and but also the relationship that we have the four of us and how lucky we are to uh still enjoy being around each other and playing music together which a lot of bands that have been together this long can't say that you know you, you talk about that 25 years and you also talk about being the forever student did did you did that former student or that younger kid did he did he know that it was going to take 25 years to get to this point uh i don't think you really know anything in the beginning <laughs> i think it's all uh flying by the seat of your pants you know I, I i knew or at least i thought i knew that this is what i wanted to do for the rest of my life but a lot of people change their mind and decide it's uh, it's either not for them or it's or it's too much of a commitment. Uh, I never did give up on on the initial dream, but uh, the actual complexities of it change day by day, year by year, and so uh, there's always something exciting around the corner. Do you see you and the band Government Mule as being ambassadors of, of people coming there? They've got the world on their shoulders, but when they leave, they're completely different people. Well, uh, when I go to a show, I want to see and hear and experience something that's never happened exactly that same way before and never will again, and that's what we're trying to offer people. Now, even uh, bands that play the same show night after night after night, the audience uh, is experiencing something that will hopefully take away the the the, the pressures of life, at least for that uh, two or three hours, you know. But I think music is even more healing than, than we realize sometimes. I know that if I didn't have it in my life, my life would not be nearly as rich. <laughs> David Bowie, the iconic superstar of rock, fashion, art, design, and sexual liberation, is a living legend in his own time. However, for the past five decades, he's managed to retain his Hollywood star, Mystique. There's a new book out. It's called Bowie the Biography, from author Wendy Lee. It's a revelation of Bowie's kaleidoscopic personal life. 
Lee explores his star-crossed childhood and family, an emotionally distant mother, once part of a British fascist party, a father who masterminded his early career, and his brother who spent most of his life in a mental institution. Haunted by fears of succumbing to his brother's illness, the young David's relentless pursuit of success in the music business was fueled by his uninhibited sexual appetite. On iHeartRadio, we are unplugged and totally uncut with the author of Bowie the Biography, Wendy Lee. Show. You are writing about a subject that has been such a major part of so many people's chapters. And for you to be this close to not only a legend in music, but entertainment, it had to have been an incredible journey. Or this could actually be the first step of a brand new journey. <laughs> Well, he's an unbelievable man, and I was lucky enough to interview so many people close to him, and to see the metamorphosis of David from a boy from, I don't know, Brixton, you would almost think maybe Brooklyn, not Brooklyn nowadays, fashionable, but Brooklyn years ago, to come to, you know, to end up in Manhattan, living in Soho, happily married and very monogamous, through all the years of wildness and experimentation and drugs, sex and rock and roll. You know, you bring up the sex. Julia Cameron writes in her book uh, that sex and creativity use the same endorphins and the human body becomes addicted to it. Do you think that David Bowie's drive towards sex was actually his language of trying to reach a bigger stage? I think anyone who is very creative wants to create drama and passion and intrigue in their own life and that can of course translate itself to a multitude of sexual experiences. Also creative people are seducers and David above all is a seducer. And he's never he's never hidden that from his from his fans either. I remember Rolling Stone magazines back in the 80s that that would speak of that and yet and yet people just always wanted to shove it into in, behind a mask basically mm, mm, mm. David is wishing very frank and open the only thing he's ever publicly denied and I tend to believe him is that the story that Angie put out a few years back well many years ago actually that David and Mick uh, she put David and Mick in bed together well it might have been in bed together but I don't actually think anything much was going on the two of them did have threesomes with other women that I know from women who were involved but at the same time, I don't think that uh, the two of them went as far as, as has been said. Ground control to Major Tom. Ground control to Major Tom. Take your protein pills and put your helmet on. As a writer of biographies, do you ever feel like that you're a burglar breaking into a famous person's home? No, not at all. Not a bit. I feel that I'm giving them full consideration. I'm assessing their life. I'm, uh, I'm, I'm clarifying things. Then you're part of the continuation then, which which makes you kind of almost like a prophet of the author. I don't understand. Ba- basically meaning that when, when you share your journeys through, through autobiography, it's a continuation. You're the one that's handing it to the next generation. And for that, I applaud yes. you big time for that. You want to be fair, you want to be balanced, and you, you want to show the person what and all. As a writer, do you connect with the people you're writing about through your dreams, or do you just sit down, have a cup of tea, and go, today I think I'm going to write about JFK? So you read a great deal through the years, and you decide who you, who, you, uh, who you want to spend a few years of your life with, because you are spending so much time of your life with that person, researching their life, interviewing everyone to do with them, and then writing. So, that's what I love about you, is, that, is the fact that you're not hiding behind a mask, and neither did David Bowie. And yet, for the past few years, because up until last year when he released his new album, he almost became the mystery man, because he, he inspired so many people like the group Kiss to become glamour rock musicians, but now David mm-hmm. has kind of has become almost invisible to a lot of us. Mm. 
David always understood Mystique. He always has done because he's had such an interesting career. You know, he was a mime artist for a while. He's tried every different kind of, of, of music. He's really plumbed every type of artistic enterprise. Do you think David has taught the lost how to see, giving them permission to, to take their dented dreams and breathe life outside their body? Still don't know what I was waiting for And my time was running wild in the dead end streets And every time I thought I got it made It seemed the taste was not so sweet So I turned myself to face me I've never caught a glimpse How the others must see the faker I'm much too fast to take that test I think what David really did, and this is years ago, is that he gave everyone permission to be themselves and not to feel ashamed that they wanted to dress up as women, that they wanted to wear makeup, that they wanted to be wild. David made normal, multifaceted. It wasn't always about the music. It was like David Bowie, the entity. It's, it's it, David Bowie, yeah. the person, is what's influenced so many people for so many decades. Our changes are taking the base John Lennon's mother was distant. Roseanne Barr talks about her distant relationship. It's, mm-hmm. it's, it's almost like you have to be dysfunctional in order to find the key to stardom. Did you find that in Bowie? I would think so, yes. I mean, everybody's childhood is their material. And David, of course, he used his in many ways. Everybody's childhood is their material. And David, of course, he used his in many ways. Doesn't he prove that we are living in the greatest moments of music history because of him being so open, it inspired other musicians to be just as open? Definitely. Definitely. What about you as a writer? Does it allow you to be more open? Because you've written about Patrick Swayze, you talked with Madonna's brother. It's almost like that you have become a legacy maker. I hope so. That's very nice. You know, but I'm never overwhelmed by the legacy. I always want to look at the self behind the image. And I believe I've done that in my biography of David Bowie. But to get behind that image, we're, we're, we live in this Google Yahoo world, and we're so addicted to Wikipedia. It's, what, what's so great about your book is that when I'm a jock on the air, I reach for books like yours so that I can have a better conversation on the air. I mm-hmm. want you to know how important you are to the people in broadcasting because you're telling us the story. But you see, Wikipedia and all that there's a facts, but it's not knowledge. You have to string facts together. You can't just spew out facts. You know, you have to analyze and evaluate. Is that difficult through the editing process? No. I'm always afraid of what's still sitting on the editor's floor. That's something that you wanted to put in the book, but the editor, of course, is just trying to sell more books. No, the editor was very fair. I had a brilliant editor, so I certainly can't complain. Do you see this being changed into a movie? Because, I mean, they're, if they're going to do a Jimi Hendrix movie, you know there's got to be a David Bowie movie somewhere along the line. Not yet. Not really? Yet. Really? No. What, what, would, what would have to happen to keep, to keep Bowie from us on the big screen? Well, I don't think anyone could play Bowie but Bowie, and I don't think he would allow that. I'm an alligator. Look at the way that he, he, he directed his, his album last year that he released. He hit social media so early, getting everybody's attention. He has played that social media game so brilliantly, it's almost like it's become a new stage for him. Well, yes, he always he was one of the earliest users of the Internet. I mean, he got a computer before practically anyone else. He got his own website. He got his own URL. He, he immediately understood the possibilities of the Internet. And it's that connection that has helped you. Have you learned anything by doing this story with David Bowie that maybe you hadn't had when you were doing all the other books? That's so hard to say, Arrow. That's hard to say. You learn something, you know, of course, a great deal. I mean, I think my book speaks for itself. And the interviewees that I've, that I've spoken to have been very forthcoming about the real David Bowie. Don't fake it, baby. All writers go through that period where when the book is finished, you go through that little, like, you're missing a best friend. Do you miss David Bowie? I feel that way. Do you feel that way, too? Very much so. 
How, how do you get over that, girl? I mean, because it, because to write a story... You move on to the next project. Oh, yeah, but Wendy, come on. It's, 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 yeah. I mean, you're talking about one of the icons of this generation. And, very difficult. It's very, very hard act to follow. I want to thank you so much for having the courage to write this book. More importantly, for writing the books that you do, because you are not just writing words on a piece of paper. You are educating not this generation, but the next seven. And I'm very proud of you for doing this. You're very kind. Thank you. I most enjoyed talking with you. Don't let me hear you say lights, taking you nowhere. (laughs) Unplugged and totally uncut with Willie Robertson. Uh, he was an arrow. It looks like arrow. It, arrow. Yeah. Arrow. God, I can't even pronounce that. That's all. <laughs> well, you know how we like are. a bow and arrow. That's exactly what it is, man. You know, I come from the state Boom, of Montana. Boom, I got it. I come from the state of Montana, so, you know, you just do what you got to do out there just to survive and be that entrepreneur, sir. Well, I'm from Louisiana, so you got to draw me a picture and I can figure it out. So. <laughs> hey, congratulations on this book, American Entrepreneur. What I love about it is that in this day of change, which we're going into a brand new year, everybody wants to lose weight. But we want to, what we want to do is we also want to gain a, a greater career. And you're giving us the history of how we can do such a thing. Right. Not everybody wants to lose weight. So I'm, I'm fine. I'm totally comfortable <laughs> where I'm at. But. <laughs> God. But I do, uh, no, I did. We wanted to put something together. Coming from Duck Dynasty, we wanted to put, uh, uh, we did American Hunter, we did American Fisherman, things we're really passionate about. And then really, though, the reason that the show was on the air was because of the entrepreneurship that my dad had and uh, wanted to come out with this different duck call. And so I invented this reed system to put in a duck and um, in, a, in a call to, to get ducks closer to us. And uh, and th- so we chronicled that business and really how we, you know, as kids, we worked in every aspect of the business. And um, you know, year after year, and, and it was a, it was a small business, and he was also you know what was paying the bills was he's a commercial fisherman, so which was a whole other industry, and we all worked at every aspect of the business as kids. Unfortunately, he didn't pay us cash for that work. Uh, that was more of an investment we were making, and uh, and also he'd say, well, well, this is what's paying for the food and your you know the house and stuff. So, which I'm glad. I mean, it was a great concept we learned. If you want something more, you got to go work hard and. Uh, get it yourself, and so yeah, I turned. I went into the worm farming business. Uh, nice. I had in fourth grade. Now that's a great business, uh, but it's very labor intensive, and uh, checkout's a nightmare. And uh, and my siblings kept stealing my inventory, so uh, <laughs> so I moved on. Uh, I ended up with a, a box of of hubba bubba bubble gum nice. uh, that this guy gave my dad. And so I was like, I had this big dilemma for a day. I stared. I go, do I chew all the gum or do I sell the gum? And I got no money in it. It's straight profit. So I went and sold it for 50 cents a piece, made a good initial deal. And I thought, oh, boy, we got we got a business here. So I went to town and reinvested all that money. I'm selling gum. I'm selling candy. I mean, I was the man who could get stuff at that school. And uh, business was really going good. I was making $100 and uh principal called me in his office and uh he said concession uh stand sales were down Uh-oh. and so he shut my business down on me yeah <laughs> thinking back i should just cut him in on the business and uh <laughs> we could have well we could have made a fortune together shoot i'd have failed fifth grade to stay in there if i'd have made that much money so i just kept i just kept it going there so we tell about those stories and then we also move into stories uh just some unique stories some people you've heard of in the book some you probably haven't heard of and just really with the challenges they overcome and these crazy businesses and the things they did and they went past the failures and they just kept going and going and going. And so we put a great collection of, of those stories in the book, you know, going from all the way to the uh, beginning of America all the way up until now. What I love is that you give some love to the Native Americans of this nation. You you actually go in there and start talking about how, how as, as a group or a community, we, we all work together as Native Americans. It really is, you know, and I don't think anybody has a business without getting help from someone else. And so we certainly saw that with the Native Americans, you know, and they were trading amongst themselves for sure. And because they would specialize certain tribes, you know, you can imagine some are great at fishing, some are great at hunting, some are great at making things and pottery. And and by the time these pilgrims come in here, and so they're going to come in here and figure out how to live on this new land and and who saves the day native americans because uh they were going to starve to death uh the pilgrims were because they couldn't figure out right. they weren't as good fishermen as they thought and uh and so they came in and helped out and uh you know their their the commodities the commodities were different you know uh 
you know, valuable things became, you know, corn. And, and, and then when the pillars come over, now all of a sudden we've got gunpowder. Now we've got trading. Now we've got businesses popping up. Horses come in, which make it easier. You know, a flood of horses, you can get around the country better. So, uh, so yeah, it really was. I mean, these are some of the initial, you know, entrepreneurs in creating these businesses. And uh, um, and, and so we do highlight that in the book. And, and then you go into George Washington, who was, yep. you know, a great business. And as well, we think about him just as a president, but he had so many businesses. I don't know how he kept up with all those business, businesses and uh, uh, just a lot of things he did from distilling whiskey to uh, meat processing and obviously fisheries there. And I've been to where he, in Mount Vernon, I've, I've been to that spot. And you can see because it's a lot of things going on with the water behind you and all the deals. But but he was and he, he started that spirit. And so and that spirit has kept on. And that's what's so great about our country is that we, we do and we still have the opportunity to go out. And if you want to do it and be your own boss, uh, uh, you can do it. Well, the, the, you're talking about that spirit. Well, with Small Business business Day coming up for, for the holidays, I mean, you, you talk about this book needs to be in someone's hands in the way that you're going to teach those small businesses, don't stop, don't quit. Well, that's the deal. Don't stop, don't quit. I, because I, I really, hopefully somebody will come up after this book and uh, as the years go by and say, man, yeah, I read that book. And, and you know, one, one story in particular inspired me to do yep. something and uh, inspired me to say, I'm going to start that thing, and I'm I'm not going to hold back. Uh, you look at a guy like Walt Disney. I mean, this guy was bankrupt a couple of times. He was out of work. He had nothing. He's on a train ride. Really, it just doom is me, and he's so mad because of uh, where he's at in his career. Draws a little uh, mouse with some red velvet pants, and uh, I think two days ago was his 90th birthday. And wow. so, well, we talk about that story about how he didn't give up, and he – he, uh, you know, and he just kept going, and so uh, yeah, you gotta, you gotta keep going. You gotta figure out where that's at. And we talked with there's people in there who started uh, businesses uh, later in life, you know, uh, some and some with very little education, and uh, but always a hard work ethic, always working hard.